Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Kim, for the kind introduction. So, what I'm going to talk today is on our work, collaborative work, uh, and with the, um, my student Wan Wen and my collaborator, Professor Sarup Bunia, at University of Florida. So, the basic idea. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about why do we care about uh, Trojan detection, and then I talk about what uh, has been done in the community, and what specifically I'm talking about. Then I'm going to present my experiments. So if you look at um, hardware, um, the life cycle, specifically in the hardware design, and what you are looking at um, on the left hand side is when the, the system on chip is getting designed by different companies, they are, uh, most of the SOC companies are not designing everything on their own. They are buying some of the components known as intellectual property blocks from different companies, putting them together, take it through their flows, and then they are fabricating it. So starting from um, the IP design, IP based system on chip design to um, fabrication to finally in field, at every step of the process, different forms of attacks are possible, has been demonstrated in the community over the years. And in this talk, specifically, I'm going to focus focus on the, the uh, vulnerability in the IP based SOC design flow. So what I'm not going to talk about in the fabrication assembly and throughout the process, what kind of reverse engineering, piracy and many other forms of attacks that's possible. So if I zoom in um, with one of our specific company who is sponsoring us, so with, from their mindset, if we have to plot or highlight which specific stage is uh, trustworthy, which specific stress is untrustworthy, and which specific stage may be scenario. So this is the specific scenario. So for example, fabrication facility, if it's in-house, then it's trustworthy. If, it, if you are giving it to a third party, then it's basically you can pray. Um, now, the whole notion of th these problems are essentially to do with the economics. So security, uh, I heard a talk, uh, interesting talk where basically security metric is money. If you invest a lot of money, security problem will go away. And the amount of money you put in, that's, th that's the security you get. So here people wanted to save money and when they are trying to do system on chip design, they are trying to outsource their design, fabrication, synthesis or some or all of the steps and that's where problems started happening and companies have less and less control on the companies um, they outsource and even if you outsource to a company that you really trust, that company internally might be outsourcing to other people, they might have contractors in the company from other companies and it's a long story. So. Um, and again, this is from our another country collaborating company who is funding us and we took one of their SOC, a router SOC, and we wanted to figure out which component they are buying or getting, which part of the world. And if you can see, except South America and Africa, everything else is covered just for that SOC. I mean, for other SOC, South America and Africa might be in the picture. So, so it's across countries. It's across companies, and that's where the, the trustworthiness becomes, an, an integrity becomes an issue. And the specific issues that um, we are mostly interested in, my group mostly working, is piracy, reverse engineering, and malicious modification. In this talk, in this work, I'm basically focusing on malicious modification. So whether you are buying an intellectual property block or a part of your design from another company and whether it has a malicious modification or you are giving your design for certain transformation, let's say synthesis to a third party company and whether they insert it inside your design, irrespective of it, it that's not what you wanted. So that's the unwanted behavior could be potentially malicious and question is when the design comes back to you, your brand name is at stake, so what can you do before you put your name stamp on that system on chip and sell it to uh, in the market? So specifically, um, hardware trojan, those of you who worked in this area, you know for the rest of you. So hardware trojan is essentially extra circuitry that sits there. So similar to software virus, it has all the categories which is nobody wants them, but they are st still there. And what can they do? That depends on what it was designed for. 
And most of the examples we have seen in news or in the community is basically either it's, uh, most of them are of information leakage. So it's trying to leak some in your protected data, could be key, could be personal information and whatever it is, the leakage of data. And in few cases, it's for destro destroying the chip or changing the behavior. Changing the behavior would essentially, um, you as a company, they are going to reduce your brand name if it can change some behavior, create some malicious scenario. So the aspect of verifying Trojan is essentially, it's, it's very still the. So you, as I go along, you will see, it's very difficult to detect. And if I have to use the word, it's impossible to detect because they are really tiny. If you have millions of gates, so you are talking about two or three gates sitting somewhere for triggering a logic and just transferring the data. So even if you are looking at the change in area, change in temperature, it's simply undetectable. And if you are thinking of verifying using your regression test suite, that's not going to work either because they are hidden in an area which is hard to detect unless you want to try all possible combination of inputs, which is theoretically impossible. So practically impossible. Now. So therefore, they are hidden in an area which is hard to detect, and therefore, what can you do? And what, uh, what has been, so just to summarize, so there are lots of types of Trojan, but the two simple one I'm going to just give a highlight. One is combinational Trojan, where you replace few combinational gates with few other gates. And um, simple example would be, let's say AND gate was originally in the design, so computation continues, but now you added an OR gate, which is a triggering condition. You choose what nodes you want to use as trigger, and typically attacker would choose rare nodes. And then you need to have a payload so that you can transfer whatever you want to transfer. So you have a triggering condition and you have a payload. And this example, it's only two gates compared to millions or billions of gates in the design. So that's the trigger. So if sequential one would be even harder to uh, detect because this particular case, it's the triggering condition is really a counter. When specific counting happens, then you basically transfer that payload to observable points. Now, if you look from the system level perspective, if you're saying I'm a system level designer, even in the system level, you can insert, if you're an attacker, you can insert truths and you can observe certain behavior in the bus. And based on certain behavior, maybe you will enable the memory write signal and write something which should not be there. You replace something or get something, whatever you want to do. So there has been a lot of work in the community in this area and which could be broadly categorized in two areas, logic testing and side channel analysis. In the previous talk, there was an interesting talk on side channel analysis. You got to see the insight. And so let's then start with side channel. In side channel analysis, basically, if you, so in both of these cases, you assume the golden model is available. It could be your another version of the design, or it could be you just know the behavior characteristics and functionality of the expected behavior. Now, in side channel analysis, you basically know what would happen in a golden design. Could be current, could be switching, could be many other signature, side channel signature. And then you try to check whether the design that you got back or finally you created versus the golden design, is there any difference? The problem with that is, as I said, the Trojan is typically going to be really, really small. It's simply going to hide in the process variation, in the noise, so you won't be able to detect it. And unless the Trojan is really, really large, which would be, that would mean the attacker is really stupid, except that case, it's simply not going to work. Now, on the other hand, logic testing is interesting only if the Trojan is small. Technically, Trojan small meaning triggering condition is small. So then it's detectable. You can run your test and it might not be that difficult. But if the triggering condition is complex, I'll use an illustrative example, then it's practically impossible to detect it. So what we are doing in this particular paper is essentially we are trying to combine the advantages. As you can see, that's why I listed this way. Hard to detect large trojans, actually large trigger trojans, hard to detect small, and easy to, so easy for large, easy for small. So it sounds like that exactly fits nicely together in, as a puzzle. That's what we wanted to do. We want to combine the advantages uh, of logic testing and side channel analysis. And I'll show an overview diagram how to do that. So even before we go there, many of you are thinking, 
why didn't the design is the way in the verification domain they call it? Why didn't they do it correct by construction? Why didn't they do design such a way so that attacker cannot insert um, the Trojan in the first place? That is possible, theoretically possible, and there has been a lot of work. I just listed two widely used one, obfuscation and encryption. So the idea of obfuscation is you, you change the design flow in such a way attacker cannot understand it. If attacker cannot understand the flow, it doesn't know where are the rare scenarios and where to hide. Therefore, it has no place to hide. Therefore, there is no way to insert. Unfortunately, there are many smart workers have shown that all of them can be broken because they don't have any, uh, either they don't have any guarantees or they might have theoretical guarantees. But when you implement an algorithm, whether it's AES or any powerful stuff, when you implement, the implementation introduces the vulnerability. So you have theoretical guarantees, but practically it doesn't matter. So on the Trojan detection, assuming Trojan cannot be avoided, designed for security solutions, then question is how do we detect them? And as I said, there are two broad areas, test generation, which is basically you have a golden model, and then you are trying to verify. With respect to that, is my expectation match? If it matches, then most likely that's not the case. Or side channel analysis based on the type of signature you are looking at. You don't care about functionality, you care about the signature. And here is a pictorial illustration. Again, although I say original design of the circuit, you may or may not have the design, but you do know the behavior. You know it's an adder. So if I'm giving two plus three here, output is expected five. So in a way, you know whether physically it exists or not, you know the expected behavior. But nonetheless, you generate interesting tests. In, in real SOC design, it's in the order of billions. You run them, and you just basically compare. And if you are a smart attacker, and um, then basically you are not going to find a difference with billions of tests. But that's the idea of logic testing. You run it, you compare and see if there is a difference. If there is a difference, assumption here is there are no bugs. If, the, if there is a buggy design, which is most of the time true, that's like a gold mine for an attacker. It's much easier to hide in bugs, in unspecified functionalities, and that's the beyond the scope of today's uh, presentation. So, but it's not effective because test space, I'll take an example, it's basically the enumeration is exponential and Trojan is still the. So now what about side channel analysis? Side channel analysis, you still run some inputs, but you don't care about their functional outputs and functional behavior. Instead, you compare some signature. In this case, I'm measuring current, you could be measuring switching, measuring many other parameters. And again, the, this has the problem of um, side channel analysis, as I said, basically the, the Trojan, even if Trojan is there, even if you activated it, even if you are double lucky, you are still third time you are not lucky because it's going to hide in the noise and process variation. It, it is simply undetectable. So what we are trying to do, we are still trying to do side channel analysis, but uh, we are going to do something little more. An analogy I'll take, let's say um, I, I am flying an airplane to drop somewhere near this palace, and I don't know where it is, it's in the night, but if I talk to the mayor, and mayor agrees to turn off the light in every part of the city, except near the palace, then it's easy for me. I can see the light, I can uh, drop there. So the idea here is we want to generate test in such a way so that the test is going to activate or maximize the switching in a Trojan area and minimize the switching in the rest of the circuit. So that the signature that I get is essentially observable, detectable. It doesn't hide in the noise anymore. But the problem here is we don't know where the Trojan is in the first place. So that's why we are making an assu big assumption here. And the big assumption here is that most likely the attacker is going to hide the Trojan in a hard to detect area. And so that's basically the model here, that we are going to look at the design, trying to find rare nodes and again, I'll define rare in this context, rare nodes. And when nodes are rare, then basically my activ activation of switching or maximizing switching would be for the rare nodes. So now I'm going to talk about what specifically has been done. And uh, what we are going to do is to activate rare nodes, as you would have observed. And let me see for an example. So let's say this is a trigger trojan. So what a trigger trojan basically means, the triggering condition consists of eight input signals. 
and that causes the trigger, and then it goes to some payload. Now, in an eight trigger kind of situation, if I assume each of the triggering node has a probability of 0 0.1, of that switching. So, for example, what that means? That means you are, let's say, simulating the circuit, you are looking at a signal or a variable, and you are seeing what percentage of the time it's changing from 0 to 1. And let's say this particular case, we are putting a threshold of 10% of the time. So then that's the, pro and let's say we call that as a rareness threshold. If you want to be rare, rare, you can set it to 1%. You can change that parameter. But essentially, even in this such a simple case, the tri triggering probability is 10 to the power minus 8. And uh, as we make it more complex, and considering attacker would be smarter than me, then it might not even use all the rare kind nodes. It might use some rare, some non-rare to make it really interesting and fundamentally impossible to detect it. So that's the whole notion. And then, so here is the pictorial illustration of what we are trying to do. So let's say this is my design, and each of the blue dots indicate non-rare node which is billions of them, and the red nodes in the, uh, the rare node, which is basically in the order of, depending on what your rareness threshold, it could be um, in the order of few hundreds or thousands. So then if I, and let's say an attacker used some of those rare nodes to create the trojan. Of course, I don't know where they are, but I'm just saying most likely it would be somewhere there. And then when I'm generating tests, I'm trying to see which of them are getting switched. And so the tests I want to select are the one that's going to maximize switching in the red areas and minimize in the blue areas. That's really the point here. And I will apply different tests. It will create different switching of different nodes, and I can analyze them. And this is the big uh, overview of the take, take away message. Basically, is first we do Trojan sampling in the sense that you, from given design, you try to figure out where are the rare nodes and uh, you define that criteria. Then you basically do test generation to activate those rare nodes, or as much as possible, to maximize them. Then we'll talk about reordering. The idea of reordering is when you are trying to maximize the switching in the rare nodes, what is happening is you are also, you are also increasing the switching in the rest of the circuit. So we are trying to do reorder to minimize that effect. And then finally, you evaluate the quality, and that's basically the whole idea. So these assumptions I already talked about. Only thing I didn't talk about is basically how do we do testing. As we realized, because these rare nodes are kind of exponential in scenario, so we cannot do kind of directed test generation, focused test generation. So what we are targeting is statistical test generation. And this idea has been borrowed from the manufacturing testing community. The basic idea is if you have lots of rare nodes or something you are trying to activate, if you throw lots of rocks at it, a certain number of them, your chances of hitting it very likely. For us, the problem is we don't know whether the trojan is two trigger, four trigger, eight trigger, we don't know anything. So what we are th throwing is randomly throwing rocks at those rare nodes and hoping there would be a point, if we are lucky, that uh, that exact combination would be activated. Our goal is to activate that trojan. And uh, theoretically, even in manufacturing testing community, people have shown that N detect test for a sufficiently large N, it actually works, it actually activates the scenario. And um, again, the paper has the basic idea that the uh, details and um, analysis, but basic idea is we are trying to generate the test or, or N detect test to activate those scenarios. And if we zoom in, I'm going to skip this zoom in slide. So if you are going to basically zoom in, then essentially we are trying to create the switching from non-rare non -rare to rare switching. That's the, that's the switching we are basically trying to do and um, to generate the test. And so this is what happens. Once you do end detect test generation to maximize switching, uh, it's basically going to switch uh, some uh, the rare nodes that we want and even the non-rare nodes that we don't want. So basically, then what do we do? We uh, talk about two efficient methods for reordering these tests. One is simple heuristics, very fast, another detailed one. And we try to see, can we get from this to this one? We are doing uh, switching of the rare nodes and not so much of the non-rare nodes. And those two um, 
techniques essentially based on a simple observation that what we really want to do, we want to increase the profit where switching of the rare nodes or those values should be maximized and total switching would be minimized so that the sensitivity, the profit if you look at it, it's really the sensitivity, sensitivity of the side channel analysis so that it's effective. So we are trying to do Hamming distance based heuristics and idea is very simple of the heuristics and interestingly it actually works. So if you are looking at a test pattern, and um, if you take two test pattern where Hamming distance of those test patterns are low, then idea is that at the input it's creating less switching, that's for sure. But it turned out even in the inside the circuit it's create less switching. And because no, non-rare nodes are the majority, so that kind of guarantees you um, heuristically, of course, there are no theoretical guarantees. And uh, quantitatively it shows it creates less switching in the main circuit. And we also did simulation based where you actually simulate pattern, a set of pattern and we kind of choose which sequence of pattern actually optim um, minimizes the rare switching and maximizes the, maximizes rare switching and minimizes the total switching. Now I'm going to straight go to the experimental res results and uh, so what we are going to look at here is essentially when you generate a set of tests, so at the end of the day this paper is going to give you a set of smart tests. So we want to evaluate quality of those tests and we use lot of parameters. I'm not going to bore you with what those parameters means, but basic idea is, is it doing lot of rare switching and least amount of overall switching? And here are some results. So again, this result is nothing as expected. If you increase the number of N, N detect test as I talked about, you are throwing rocks, remember I'm saying you are throwing rocks N times, N of them. If you increase the N, your sensitivity the um, uh, signature switching de se detection sensitivity increases, which is not surprising, which is the easy part. But the, non the interesting part is this particular blue line is essentially saying the switching of the rare nodes improves, which is good sign, which is what we wanted. But the bad news is this brown line that overall switching is also increasing. And that is a bad news. Then it's still kind of for side channel analysis, it's still not a good idea. So what we really wanted to do is um, we want to reorder the test as I talked about. After reordering, we get the effect on uh, the rare node switching increases and the overall switching actually decreases. So for these coefficients, even Hamming distance, which is such a simple uh, one, it's still kind of work. It distinguishes, it's distinguishable. But for the other ones, it's basically in the interesting area. C1 to C5 is really interesting area. There is hardly any switching in the overall circuit and maximum switching in the rare node areas. And then we actually applied on real design from Trust Hub benchmarks and ISCAS 45 benchmarks where trojans are not inserted by us, it's in the benchmarks. And we want to do so how effective it is for four trigger trojans and eight trigger trojans. And what we observed is that compared to the random, if you do random test generation versus Miro, uh, Miro was a logic testing best test generation and the state of the art uh, as far as this work is concerned. And we, our sensitivity, sudden sensitivity increase is significant, 152% on, on, um, on average, and uh, for random, and 62% compared to Mero. And same thing for uh, similar number for eight trigger trojans. And uh, for, again, these benchmarks are already out there in the benchmark suite, which has trojans inserted, and we, we run our approach. And to, to conclude, the takeaway message is in this particular work, what we are trying to do is essentially, um, we call it MARS, multiple excitation of rare switching. We are trying to combine the advantages of logic testing and side channel analysis. And the key idea is we want to generate smart tests such that switching in the rare nodes are maximized and the switching in the rest of the circuit is minimized so that side channel analysis is effective. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me ask another question. Uh, uh, in the talk, you mentioned two different kind of Trojan in hardware. It's a combinational, com combinational lo uh, one and sequence lo logic or something. So could, could you imagine other type of Trojan that can potentially bypass your statistical test cases that you generate? So um, 
there are other trojans and many of them i don't even know moles and ma many others and but what we have observed that because our model of trojan is really somebody hiding in the rare node so as long as different types of trojan the ones i know and the ones i don't know they are trying to hide there we'll be able to detect it but if somebody comes up with a kind of a trojan scenario where the assumption of rareness actually goes away, rare node scenario goes away, then of course it's not detectable. Isaac Chef, Cornell. Uh, I'm curious, since your benchmarks are normalized, what actually are the odds of detecting a Trojan given some period of time of testing? So let me see if I understood the question. Is the question is Trojan gets activated only after millions of cycles? Um, is that how many cycles it takes? I, I don't have a sense of... So the idea is that's an orthogonal research. So there has been research in the... I also work in post-silicon validation area. So idea there is if, if you have a bug that comes it after millions or billions of cycles, then in, in the real cheap, even two seconds of uh, post-silicon execution on RTL would take months. So there are orthogonal research which basically shows how can you take an execution cycle of million or billion and reduce it to few thousand. So to apply this technique, you have to reduce it to that kind of scope. If you're asking if the Trojan get activates after a long, long time, how would you make it? But that reduction is required. Uh, please tell us your name and affiliation. Uh, Watson Ladd, UC Berkeley. So it seems that you need a known good physical implementation in order to get the uh, switch, in order to get information about the side channels. So what's, let's say somebody inserts a Trojan. You say, I ran the detector. The side channel characteristics are different. And they call you back and say, of course they're different. We just changed our netlist processing to mask processing. So of course you're going to get a completely different circuit. How do you distinguish that sort of innocuous change from insertion of a Trojan? Do you think that there's realistic changes that can be made to supply chain to enable Trojan detection? So interesting question. So this particular question, you are if I'm understanding you right, you are saying when you make certain changes, non-functional valid changes, so then question that change is going to introduce a difference in side channel signature. And again, as I said, for when you are trying to focus Trojan detection, you have to assume there are no other problems. So again, this analogy is there in hardware community, manufacturing testing community.